You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space, reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. We have a scoop for you this week. An exclusive interview with SpaceX founder Elon Musk. We'll ask him how things are going as he and his team prep for that high stakes first flight of the Falcon 9 rocket. And we'll also share with you Dave Letterman's reaction to seeing his first shuttle launch. That's coming up shortly. But first, some other space news. And this week, in honor of the Falcon 9 countdown and Dave's first launch, we're doing it top 10 list style. Number 10 story this week comes from the fourth rock from the sun, my very educated mother, Mars. That's right, Mars. On March 20th, the rover Opportunity overtook the Viking 1 lander and now holds the surface longevity record for NASA probes on Mars. Opportunity is now six years, 116 days, and counting into a three-month mission. But if you're listening, Oppie, don't rest on your laurels. Your sibling's spirit is on the other side of the planet and is in winter hibernation mode. And if she manages to wake up come spring, she will grab the record. Spirit, you'll recall, landed on Mars about three weeks before Opportunity back in January of 2004. And as long as we're on Mars, the team at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory commanded the Mars Odyssey spacecraft to make a final listen for life signs from the Phoenix Mars lander this week. Phoenix landed in the northern polar region back in 2008 and operated successfully for about six months until the cold and dark of the Martian winter set in and the craft went silent. Mission managers were pretty sure that the lander would not survive the winter, but figured it wouldn't hurt to see if they might be able to reestablish communication. Looks like no dice, though. Rest in peace, Phoenix. Which brings us to our number nine story and an update on a manned mission to Mars that is launching next month. Had you there for a minute, didn't I? Actually, it's an ersatz trip to Mars that will never get off the ground. I'm talking about the Mars 500 simulated mission to the Red Planet. Liftoff, well, actually lockdown, is set for early June. Six crew members, two Europeans, one Chinese, and three Russians will spend 520 days locked inside a spacecraft mock-up at the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow. Mission controllers are doing their best to make this mission as close to the real thing as possible. They'll have to take all the food they'll need with them from day one. No ordering in pizza, a la Biosphere 2. Communication is limited to email. It will be intermittent, just as it would be on a real interplanetary voyage. And it will include a delay of as much as 40 minutes. ESA has picked uh, their two crew members already, Diego Urbina, who has Italian-Colombian nationality, and Frenchman Romain Charles. The rest of the crew will be announced later this month. Our number eight story this week, Oil's not so well in the Gulf of Mexico, and NASA is pitching in to help. The space agency flew its King Air research aircraft over the Gulf this week in an effort to help monitor the size and thickness of the BP oil spill. Researchers are wondering how the oil might impact sea life. The Langley-based King Air 200 was outfitted with instruments normally used to study clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere, which researchers hope can help them learn more about oil spills. NASA satellites have also been trained on the oil slick since the drilling rig exploded in April. Crew members aboard the ISS have a unique vantage point to keep an eye on the growing environmental crisis. Cosmonaut Oleg Kotov has been watching the oil spread. I'm just uh, 30 minutes ago. We passed over the Mexican Gulf and we uh, took a lot of pictures of this oil spot on our, and believe me, it looks it's very scared. It's, uh, that's not good and uh, I really uh, feel not good about that. Which brings us to our number seven story which takes us below the sea. For yet another simulated space mission, two astronauts are embarking on the 14th expedition of the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations, or NEMO for short. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield and NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn and two other crew members are spending two weeks in the Aquarius Underwater Laboratory off Key Largo. Mock-ups of a lander, rover, and robotic arm have been positioned on the seafloor nearby. The crew will venture out on simulated spacewalks to work with the gear and practice setting up a habitat on another planet. Inside, they'll do some experiments aimed at learning more about human behavior and performance on a long-duration space voyage. And now, number six on the list. 
to the second rock from the sun we go. Let's see, my very Venus. That's right, Venus. Doesn't get nearly as much attention as Mars. Why, you ask? Does she need a better agent? Well, the simple answer is Venus is a very inhospitable place. Blistering hot with crushing surface pressure. In short, hell off Earth. But Venus scientists are still very intrigued, and if all goes well, they will soon know more about our fiery neighbor, thanks to a Japanese spacecraft called Akatsuki. JAXA officials call Akatsuki the first interplanetary weather satellite, and it is rigged with instruments to study the atmosphere, search for active volcanoes, and image lightning strikes. After the Japanese H-2A rocket deploys Akatsuki, it will also jettison a second payload, a small cylinder housing a solar sail. Once the sail opens, it will stretch nearly 66 feet in diameter, and it will fly through space like a kite. Instead of wind pushing it along, pressure from photons of light from the sun will propel it. Number five on our list, from a planet nearby to a galaxy nearby, check out this new infrared view of the galaxy Messier 83, a perfect spiral. This was taken using an instrument called Hawk 1 on the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope in Chile. Messier 83 is located 15 million light years away in the constellation Hydra, or the Sea Serpent. Astronomers think this spiral galaxy looks a lot like our own Milky Way. Number four on the list, the latest on the zombie satellite, known as Galaxy 15. The wayward, unresponsive Intelsat communication satellite is still haunting the geosynchronous neighborhood. Other operators had to move two of their birds out of the way in order to stay clear of the zombie, which could knock them off the air. Galaxy 15 got blasted with a solar storm in early April. It's still transmitting, but ground controllers are unable to control it. So run for your lives. Well, not exactly. Our number three story this week, the much anticipated first flight of Falcon 9. The whole space world will be watching to see how the rocket does on its maiden test voyage. The stakes couldn't be higher for the builder, SpaceX, and its founder, Elon Musk. I caught up with him via Skype. Uh, Elon Musk, thank you for joining us on This Week in Space. Tell us how things are going and uh, what uh, your big issues are right now that you're dealing with as you try to get ready for this inaugural flight, this inaugural test flight of Falcon 9. Well, um, we've, we're, the rocket is ready to fly right now. Um, we're, we're just working through the final documentation uh, with the FAA and with Air Force Range Safety. Um, and things are moving pretty quickly. Uh, it's always difficult to predict uh, you know, exactly how long these things will take because it's not, it's not entirely within our control. In fact, it's largely not within our control. Um, but uh, I, I think we've got a, a chance of, of, of potentially launching at the end of next week. Um, and then if, if not at the end of next week, then I think it gets pushed back into roughly mid-June, uh, depending on... Um, the uh, schedule of other launches at Cape Canaveral. You know, managing expectations in this case is a very important thing. There's obviously a lot of scrutiny here, probably more scrutiny than you uh, expected uh, initially, on <laughs> right? Yeah. I, th I think that's safe to say. So, um, that is safe to say. How are you managing that and how are you managing the expectations for success and, and how would you measure, what are your metrics for success on this one? Um, well, um, I think that this, this is a test launch. Uh, it, as with any test, uh, the success is somewhat of a percentage. You know, so how much, how far did you get uh, to your goal? And that constitutes the sort of percentage of success, if you will. Um, so it really, it's a question of how, how far motion. It's, it's not strictly speaking a time-based thing. It's rather maybe an event-based thing. Um, you know, there's obviously the initial liftoff and deployment of the hold-down arms, uh, because one of the things we have with our rocket is we have a built-in uh, safety system where we hold the rocket for three seconds after start of engines, uh, and then uh, do a complete health check of the vehicle, automated health check of the vehicle, before releasing the rocket for flight. Um, 
you know, does it, does that all work? Does it release for flight? Does it, um, does it take off and clear the pad? Um, that's obviously a, a milestone I hope we, we accomplish. Um, and then you start to encounter phases of flight. It's going to go through uh, um, the sound barrier. Uh, it's going to uh, go hypersonic uh, to vacuum. Um, and then through all this period, is the guidance navigation control system keeping it on track? Is the, is the rocket computer functioning correctly, the engine computers, uh, the telemetry system? And then um, a particularly uh, risky time is the stage separation. Um, and so does that stage sep separation event occur properly? Uh, does the second stage engine ignite as it should? Um, that's also a, a, a risky area. Um, and after ignition, does the, does the stage uh, capture its vector, which means does it sort of gain control of itself and track to um, the, the, the path that it's supposed to track to? Um, and uh, things like do, do we meet our specific impulse targets? Um, how, how do we do on propellant depletion? Um, what is the accuracy of orbit insertion? Uh, on azimuth, on altitude, you know, perigee, apogee, um, and uh, and then ultimately, do we reach full orbital velocity? So, and so a, a safe shutdown. So, you, so you have any number of of bars that you have to to cross over, and and how will we know, and how will you know if you've had a good day? Huh. Well, certainly a, a great day would be reaching orbital velocity. Um, that is a super hard thing. Uh, only a few countries have, have done that. Um, so if we can achieve that, that would make it a great day. Um, you know, even if even if there are other things that are sort of aren't fully completely optimal, if we can at least um, reach orbit, that's that that would be awesome. Um, I think it would still be a good day if the first stage uh, functions correctly, because um, then we you know we've proven out the first stage. That's you know half of the equation right there. Um, so that's still a good day, even if the second stage uh, malfunctions. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously a bad day, a really bad day would be if something happens on the launch pad itself, and then we lose the whole rocket, and we also damage the pad, um, and don't really gain that much, you know, gain very little data uh, about, about the vehicle in flight. Um, that would be the bad. So I would say those are sort of the, you know, bad, good, and great. So, are you losing sleep right now? Uh, how how nervous are you? How much pressure is the team feeling? How do you feel right now? I feel okay. I mean, I I, I always lose sleep before launch. I wish I didn't, but I, I always do. Um, you know, the the pucker factor increases <laughs> as you approach launch day, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it is a it is a uh, a very scary day for sure. Um, yeah. Elon Musk, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Which brings us to our number two story. The space shuttle Atlantis finishing strong in space. The six astronauts on OV-104's last manifested mission accomplished all they set out to on their trip to the station. They installed a new Russian lab, replaced some batteries, and brought up supplies and spare parts, including a backup satellite dish for space-to-ground communications. Atlantis is not headed straight to a museum to be named later at wheel stop, however. Instead, the KSC team will process her to be ready to fly on short notice should one of the final two crews need to be rescued. So there she'll be, ready to fly. Why not one more flight with a crew small enough so they could come home on a Soyuz capsule if need be? Just saying. And now, drum roll please, our number one story for this week in space. Dave Letterman was there for the last scheduled launch of Atlantis. So how was it for him? When this uh, uh, rocket uh, go, goes up, it's just remarkable, uh, the visual side of it. And then because, uh, I always forget this, I think sound travels uh, slower than, to than the, uh, light and light. Yes, yeah, something yes. like that. The sound of it comes to you a little bit later after you see the, the plumes of smoke. And, the, and the, it looks like the whole thing is on fire. And then you get this tremendous ground-shaking rumble. And your jaw drops. And about, of course, I uh, was taking a leak. And 
missed most you, of them. I was in the men's room. This is what people were telling me. I wish somebody had just said, Dave, it's, hey, it's, but no. Thank you, Dave. And if you haven't been to a launch, you better start making some plans. Only two left, and everyone who watches Twist should see one. That's an assignment. Thanks for watching, and thanks to our loyal sponsor, Binary Space. Please stay in touch. Send us an email, twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us, at This Week in Space. Check out the blog, milesobrien.com. And don't forget to consider giving us a small donation via PayPal. We do this show for love, not money. Next week, comings and goings in space. The latest on the first launch of Falcon 9 and the last landing of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, maybe. And we will hear one more time from the J.D. Salinger of the Astronaut Corps, Neil Armstrong, who is railing against the Obama space plan. We'll see you then.